All right. So let me ask you guys, does anyone remember what we were going to be talking about today? That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Closer? I know. That's, I figured you meant the mic. Is that better? Is that good? All right. Does anyone remember what we were going to be talking about today? Does anyone remember what we talked about last weekend? Marriage, marriage right? And Christ showing up in our marriages. And right along, um, right along with those things, I said that, you know, last week we were going to talk about marriage. And another thing that's close to our heart, especially at this church, is what? All right. Well, I'm hoping the rest of the talk just hit so strong that that might have just missed, right? That might have not been one of your highlights. But I said last week we were going to be talking about marriage, and this week we were going to talk about parenting, because I know that that is a super... Oh, is that me? Oh, okay. Um, Actually, I'm not even going to read the passage. I just opened to where it is in the book, so you're, you're safe. I'm going to give a, a paraphrase of it. Well, actually, I guess maybe there... Well, I'll just read it. Um, because I know, especially at this church, one of the things that we are very passionate about this church is a lot of us are young families, and a lot of us have kids, and I know that it's close to all of our heart because one of the biggest fear... Uh, I don't want to say the biggest fear. I'm going to say one of the biggest prayer that parents are, are just praying all of the time is, God, watch out for our kids. Like, protect our kids, guide our kids keep harm away from our kids, but more importantly, like let them be God-fearing, let them grow up in your wisdom. Um, and, I, and I know that this is something that I can stand on my soapbox and talk about all day, but the, the thing that I want to share right off the bat is my kids are way too young for me to be giving this talk, okay? And I don't want you guys to think that by any means I've learned the secret pattern or something where I've kind of figured something out, but whenever we are talking or whenever anyone is talking, God willing, all we do is we look at the Bible and we see this is what the Bible says. It doesn't mean we've implemented it perfectly. It doesn't mean that anything other than that, but what I really want us to do is there's this actually, there's this great passage in here where um, I came across years ago and it hit me and it hit me as a parenting passage, even though it's not a parenting passage. I'm going to read this, uh, this little story here in... Um, I guess you can put it up. It's in 2 Kings 11. And you're, you're going to read it, and you're, you don't really see how that's really a parenting passage. But then we're going to go ahead, and we're going to unpack it together. And I think not only is it, it's not necessarily a, a parenting passage, but it gives such insight to what every single one of us should be thinking about, praying about, considering when it comes to our kids. It's in 2 Kings 11. There's a lot of names in here, so I'm going to kill it. So just forgive me. Um, there we go. When that person, the mother of that person, um, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the heirs. But then that person, the daughter of King Jorab, the sister of Azariah, took Joash, the son of Azariah, and stole him away um, from among the king's son, who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from that person, and when they, um, so that he was not killed. So he was hidden with her in her house of the Lord for six years while that person reigned over Israel, okay? So I'm going to tell you that you might look at that and be like, well, I don't really understand what's going on here, right? Um, so I'm going I'm to share a little bit about what happened, okay? So if you continue reading the story, um, it, it, it's crazy, right? Because Joash was the one who was hidden, okay? Joash was this kid and he was hidden. And in the seventh year, right, he was brought out from hiding and became king over Israel. And not only was he brought out over his, uh, to be king over Israel, it says that he was a great king. And I know a lot of the times we know about King David because so much was written about him, right? But the nation of Israel had other great kings, and, and Joash was one of these great kings. And it said um, that such a great king, like they had 40 years of some of the most pros prosperous times right? And power fields that they had under this king. But the, the crazy thing is, is there's something hidden in that story. And I believe if you look at that story, you're going to see something about parenting there. And there's something that we're all called to. Because even though I read that passage and it didn't make a lot of sense right off the bat, I'm going to break it down and give you the Cliff Notes version, right? That, that first person, um, I'm just going to kill these names. I'm horrible at names, but Athaliah, right? The mother of Ahaziah, um, well, she had her son, right? So that, that lady had a son, and her son was king over Israel, and he died young. He died prematurely. <clears throat> and
and uh, rather than what's common, which would the, the, if the king passes away, you know who does who's the next king? A son, right? Well, this woman was she was wicked and she was corrupt, right? And rather than allowing one of her own grandchildren to become king, she had them all killed. So that who would take the throne? Herself. Okay, so she literally slaughtered all of her grandchildren except for one. And why was that one not slaughtered? Because he was hidden, right? Because he was hidden. They hid him to protect him from his own grandmother who literally wanted to kill him. You know, so you think about this idea and it reminds me, if, you, if, you've, have, if you've got kids, right? And maybe a little, actually, no, it starts rather young, right? But you think about when you play hide and seek with your kids, Right? Um, and there's been times where I play hide and seek with my kids, they're a little bit older, where they have literally scared me half to death sometimes. While I'm looking for them, they kind of jump out. And I will tell you, and I did not clear this first, but there was one specific game of hide and seek with my wife where she almost sent me into cardiac arrest. <laughs> literally, and she's laughing, and she's not mad because she's very proud of the way that she plays hide and seek, but it was she literally almost scared me half to death. But anyways, I'll never, ever play hide and seek with her again. She's way too competitive. And literally almost killed me. Anyways, so when we play hide and seek, there's this whole thing where it's a lot of fun, right? But go back to this game of hide and seek, right? This, this game of hide and seek was not fun at all. This was for literally, it was for this kid's life. And if they were found, it was not going to be cute. And because <clears throat> they were literally hiding Joash from his grandmother, and it was a case of life and death. Serious consequences. And so what I want to talk about today is that is exactly the same exact thing that God is trusting us with, right? He wants us to provide that hiding place for our kids. And I think that this goes for, you know, for parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, people who've been entrusted to you, because we have to hide our kids from, what's, from everything that's going out that, that's trying to harm them. And I'll be honest with you, like a lot of times they like, maybe, maybe you don't have kids. I guarantee you, even if you do not have your own kids, you can still be a, refer- a refuge to the people around you in your life. And the first thought that I wanted to ask is, is it worth it? And I think honestly, if you have to ask yourself as a parent, like it's tiring. Like it is tiring to always try to protect your kids and hide your kids, Right? And I'm going to tell you firsthand that I've got four of them. All of them are punks. Um, And and I'm tired. And I I remember one time when my kids were very, very young, like, like, like toddlers. I heard this great talk on parenting. And it was talking about the fact that, like, you know, be scarce with your nose, right? Try not to say no all of the time. Like your kid wants a stupid haircut, let the kid get the stupid haircut. It's just a haircut. Your kid wants to do that. If it's not a big deal, let him do it. So that way, when you, can, when you say no to something, you're saying no to something that really, really matters, right? And I thought that that was such a beautiful thing, right? Like when my kid wanted to wear the blue shirt and I wanted him to wear the red shirt, all right, I'll be scarce, scarce with my nose, right? When he wants to choose that instead of that, like I'll be scarce with my nose. But I'll be honest with you, when they get older, there are things as parents that we cannot say yes to, right? Like it doesn't matter how many times we say no when it comes to those important things. We can't be scarce with our no's because those no's can be very, very big problems, right? And we get so much pushback. I remember, you know, I felt at times at this at these days, at this age, I want to be scarce with my nose. I want it so bad, but I want to be scarce with my nose for a different reason. And that reason is just because I'm tired. I don't have the fight in me. I don't, I don't want to argue with my kid again and again and again over like the, the silliest things. And they wear us down. I remember I was talking to one youth one time and the mom told me that there was like some big conflict that had kind of happened. Like she said no to something and, and the kid did it anyways. And I'm sitting there talking to him. I'm like, hey man, like, dude, where, where did we go wrong here, right? Like, why couldn't you just listen? And he says, the problem is not that I did it. He's like, yeah, I get it. I did it. Um, but the real problem is, is I just misplayed it. He's like, if I had to be honest with you, usually I just keep asking over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until I wear her down and then I get my Yes. And then I get my yes and I do it and nobody cares. I just wasn't in the mood for the song and the dance this time, right? So I, I just did it without her permission, even though I know I could have just worn her down. 
And I felt convicted as a parent. Like, is that how our kids are playing us? That they just know that after repetition and after nagging and after everything else that we'll just kind of give in? And I think, I think that was very convicting for me. And I believe a lot of the times we have this voice in our head, I'm not going to say who it is, but it's not God, right? And it's basically telling us, hey, just give in. It's just not a big deal. Just kind of let it go. Other kids are doing it. You're too extreme. Look around you. Your kid's better than these other kids. You know, what's the big deal? And just let them be like the other kids. And when we feel tired and we don't have the fight in us, that sounds like great advice. But I will tell you, a lot of the times, what do we hear? We hear everybody's doing it, right? Like everyone has it. Everyone's, you know, indulging in this, right? And we'll be like, yeah, I guess that's a good point. But then I'm going to ask you to look around, right? Do you want your kid acting like these other kids that are out there? Because on one side, we'll be like, everybody's doing it. And on the other side, we're going to say, all these kids are punks. And if you're going to let them do what everybody else does, then guess what? All those kids are punks are going to include your kids too and my kids. So that's not a good rationale. You know, I'm shocked at the behavior I see these days with some of these kids and everyone, you know, <clears throat> we are so surprised by what we are actually seeing with, in some of these kids that are kind of growing up. And, and I'm going to tell you something, this whole mentality of everybody else is doing it and this has become normalized and whether it's right or whether it's wrong, like that's not discussed anymore. Now what we're talking about is not right versus wrong, but what's normal. And normal is a horrible bar. You have to acknowledge that. And I'm going to tell you something you don't want to hear. And this is something I remember I said this years ago, right? And it's something that I think about all of the time is that what's all of our favorite verses, right? All of our favorite verses when it comes to our kids is Jeremiah 29, 11, right? If you don't know the reference, when, when I start talking, you will know. It says, for I know the plans I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we hear that. I'm telling you, I got kids. When, when kids are born, they get inscribed in pillows, on blankets. They put it in a picture. They put it in the wall. They put it, you know, everyone loves that verse when it comes to their kids, right? And they think somehow that that verse is some sort of biblical promise that nothing bad's ever going to happen to your kid. And I love that verse because of the fact that it says that like it makes us all warm and fuzzy inside and makes us think that no matter what happens, God's going to take care of them, right? And I'm going to tell you like that verse is a promise, but I'm going to tell you the responsibility of that verse is not on God. I think a lot of times you said about God, but you said, but you said, but I'm going to tell you it's not on him alone. What that verse is responding to, it says that, you know what, that he has, he has a plan for them. He has a plan, but here's the, here's, here's the part that just breaks my heart. You know who else has a plan for your kid? Satan has a plan for your kid. Do you think Satan's plan for your kid is for them to prosper, right, and to do great things? Do you think he has plans of peace? No. Here's something that's going to freak you out. Satan's plan for you, drug addiction, brokenness, sexual immorality, Right? You know that Satan's just looking around at your kids and basically saying, man, if I could just wedge a foot in there, right? If I could just plant a seed in there, you know, God's plan's completely different, right? I love it because basically Ephesians 2 10, it says that we have been prepared for good works beforehand for us to walk into. So God is basically saying that I gave you this great plan, right? Like I gave you this great path, but who has to walk in it? We have to walk in it. Our kids have to walk in it. But they have the option, maybe they won't. You know, and, and the thing that freaks me out, and guys, this is very, very real, especially when it comes to, to our kids. You know, think about Satan, right? Like, our kids are not off limits. Do you think that he's going to say that that's not playing fair? Do you think he's going to back off of your kids because he's all about, like, you know, respecting boundaries? To be honest with you, I think Satan looks at our kids and he's like, that's a two for one. Maybe even a three for one, right? Because if I attack the kid and the kid falls, whose heart am I breaking? The parents, right? And if I attack the kid and I get the kid, who else am I affecting? Future, their kids, generations after generations. So if you think that somehow that this is not directly tied to your kids, I'm going to tell you guys you are mistaken. 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may upset. 
Stumble? No. Devour. Devour. That's the only plan. That's the only plan. And I will tell you, it breaks my heart because I think when he looks at all of our kids, right, he wants to destroy them. It's not about stumbling them. It's not about like, you know, no one ever wakes up and says, hey, I want my kid to be a drug addict. Right? But that's exactly what Satan's plan is. Right? No one ever wakes up and says, I want my kid to be promiscuous. But Satan's thinking, man, if I could just get them to be promiscuous. Right? If I could just get them to doubt God. If I could just get them, if I could just get them, if I could just get them. Right? He wants to destroy the soul of our kids. And I will tell you, that the worst thing that can happen to our kids is if they open up Pandora's box. There are so many different things where if they just open Pandora's box, then their battle is gonna become exponentially harder. So we have to protect them, right? We have to protect them. And his sights, I believe, are set on every little boy, every little girl. He wants to confuse them, he wants to deceive them, he wants to destroy them. And I'll be honest with you, if you look at it now, even down to their identity, like in, it's in 2023, and now we have to walk our kids through their gender. Like if you really start thinking about how he's playing this game now. But he looks out and he sees broken people, al- al- alcoholics, you know, addicts. He dreams for it. He delights in that. So we have to hide our kids. We have to protect our kids. What do we need to hide them for? We need to, we need to hide them from wickedness. We need to ro- hide them from the worldliness that's all around us. Right? I'll be honest with you, we have to hide them from temptation. Sometimes we just, it's just, we just have to hide them from temptation. And I know a lot of people saying, hey, Pete, like we can't put our kids in bubbles, right? Or we can't just hide them in a little greenhouse. Like the reality is that they live in the world, and I'm going to tell you 100% they live in the world. I don't doubt that one bit. My kids live in the real world too. But I'm going to actually just give you an example, right? But if you've got a very small seed, where are you going to put it, right? You're going to, you're going to put it in a greenhouse, right? Because it's small and it's vulnerable. And once it grows and it gets stronger, then it can survive where? Outside. But if you put it outside too early, there's going to be death. There's going to be damage. There's going to be hard, right? So my thing is, is how protected are our kids right now? Because a day will come when we're sending them to high school and to college and, and to the outside. But we have to protect them. We have to let them learn how to be strong and how to grow today, so that they can endure and they can survive outside. As long as we have them at home, as long as we have them under our roofs, as long as they are in our presence, we have to be protecting them and we have to be hiding them. It's what God's called us to do. You know, I believe that one of the, one of the lies, and I would say probably one of the most common lies that I believe that we hear from Satan, is that if we are raising our kids according to the truth, that we're being too restrictive. And it's something all of the time. I, I still remember one time, actually, I didn't include the story with you, but whatever. Um, Christina was serving a, a youth at, at, at her church, and she was talking to her mom, and she's telling her mom, like, hey, she's giving her a little bit of, like, constructive criticism about this and that and all of this other stuff. And the mom basically looked at Christina, and she says, I'm not trying to raise St. Mary here. And I was like, like, I heard this story, and I was like, who would not want to raise a St. Mary? Like, I would love to have a St. Mary. <laughs> right? But it just shows, like, you know, a lot of the times we've been deceived into thinking, like, we are measuring with the wrong ruler over what success is. You know, so what if they don't get all of the experiences that everyone else gets, right? Everyone's saying, you're being too strict on them, let them live. And the problem is, is we might have that mentality, but who pays the price for it? The kids. The kids don't know any better. The same way that a two-year-old He would love to walk around eating cotton candy all day and never have a solid meal. That is their best plan ever. But as a parent, we have to step in and say, that is not good for you. No matter how much you would enjoy it, no matter how much pleasure you would receive from it, that is very destructive. Um, And I'm going to tell you, a lot of the times, um, if you actually, it it, it floors me, and this is, I'll kind of age myself here a little bit, but I remember I was, when I was young, and I'm talking, this is probably, I don't know, this must have been like junior high, maybe high school. Uh, you know, I had parents that weren't very engaged in that, that aspect of the things. And I remember I was like, you know, early, young, watching like Married Loves Children. Uh, no, Married with Children. And I remember the other day, 
like it was on at like the gym or something, right? So I was sitting there doing cardio and it was up on the screen. And I was like, oh, I remember that show. Like after like five minutes, I'm like, I had no business watching this when I was like 12 or 13 years old. Thank God. Like, you know, that could have gone like a lot worse if I actually understood what was going on, right? But the problem is, is there's a lot of that going on today. And to be honest with you, it's a lot worse than married with children. If we were really, really honest with ourselves. I remember one day, this is, I remember when Nathaniel was, um, he was probably maybe fifth, sixth grade, um, and he was watching like Netflix, and I had, you know, like I was just like, hey, I gotta know what you're watching, just to make sure you're not watching anything inappropriate. And he's like, dad, there's no good TV shows on. Let me step it up a category, right? So I, I went, I said, let me, let me see if I can find you something that I'm okay with, right? And I was watching it, and it was, it was the equivalent of like, you know, what I would watch um, when I was in like fifth or sixth grade, like, you know, kind of like a Saved by the Bell, so, sort of TV show. And I said, okay, this is probably fine. They're probably gonna talk about crushes and stuff, but you know, that's age appropriate. We'll, we can walk them through all that stuff. Within the first episode, they already talked about um, homosexuality. Like, you know, they had like, you know, elementary school kids dating each other that were like same gender. They were talking about smoking weed. They were, and all, all in a positive light. And I think the rating on this thing was like, it was, it was really low, right? Like it should have been safe. And I think a lot of times we need to wake up. We need to wake up about what's going on right now. Right? And I'm going to tell you that you're not old school by telling them that God's a priority, that God is okay with some things, and that he is not okay with other things. It is okay to force your kids to come to church even when they don't feel like it. And I'm going to tell you a beautiful word that every parent needs to learn is no. And I will tell you that it is something that I think is lacking a lot of the times now because I got a lot of parents who are more concerned being their kids', fr their kids friends instead of being their kids' parents. Heard a great quote the other day, and it says, if you raise your kids, you will spoil your grandchildren. If you spoil your kids, you're going to raise your grandchildren. And I'm not going to lie, a couple people in my life, I'm kind of like, yeah, that's kind of true, right? See where they're living now, where their kids are, who's taking care of them? And I was like, yeah, I could, hindsight 2020, I guess I could have saw that coming. So my question for the parents are, are you providing are you faithfully providing protection for your kids? Are you hiding them, right? And I'm gonna tell you, Satan makes us feel bad about planting our kids in the word of God, right? But we need to set the example. We need to show our, and I love it because, you know, I love in Joshua where he basically says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like, I wonder do, if we were gonna, if we were gonna hang that up in our house somewhere, would our kids look at that and be like, yup? Or are they just gonna think that it's just a normal, like nice piece of art? Like, we have to lead by example here. I don't care what the culture says. Like, we have to make it very, very clear what our houses are all about. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I wrote something on my hands. I couldn't read my own writing. But I will tell you that personally, like, over the last couple of years, one of the greatest joys I've ever, that, like, I've been able to, to witness with my own eyes is I have a love for watching family serve together, right, where I see the different generations involved, when they're kind of like involved, you got the parents doing it, you've got the kids involved in it, and everyone's doing it together. Because I believe that when I see something like that happens, it warms my heart. And when it warms my heart, I know God is in heaven smiling. But so many times we kind of do our own thing and we let our kids do their own thing and we figure they'll figure it out once they get there. No, 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 no. It's not taught, it's caught, right? Like they've got to see you doing it. They've got to be involved with you doing it. This has got to be all hands on deck. This has got to be a way of life at your house right? And when that becomes your normal practice at the house, then they just think that that's how things go. And one day when they have their house, they're going to do things the same exact way that, things, that they think that things go. Like, guys, let's just be honest with ourselves. We're passing on plenty of bad, bad habits to our kids. Shouldn't we be teaching them some of the good stuff? Like, we should definitely be teaching them some of the good stuff. And I want you guys to notice something about the story that we read, right? That lady wasn't just after somebody, right? It's not like that wicked grandmother was just out there just killing all of these kids, right? Who was she after? She was after the kid, or actually all of the kids. She was after all of the kids with potential. The only ones that she cared about were the ones with potential, the ones that could do something. It was the kids with a special purpose. Joash had the potential of being a great king the one who might be a great leader. And that's why, her, that's why she was targeted, right? And I'm gonna tell you, our kids, 
Our kids are not problems. Our kids are potential. If you looked at your kid, and I know that every single one of us, because we have parent eyes, right? Everyone else will out there will be like, your kid's a punk, like the worst kid in the church. We're going to be like, la, 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 You know what I mean? <laughs> like he's, so I'm going to tell you, there's nobody who sees potential in their kid like a parent. And I'm going to tell you, I, I'm telling you, remember that. Remember that your kids have so much potential, right? You're not just guiding their innocence. You're, you're guarding their potential. Because if we are successful, we hide them correctly, and we protect them correctly, God can do amazing things through them. The only reason Joash was able to be the king that he was was because he was given the opportunity because he was hidden and protected. And these kids are not ours. This is the ultimate stewardship. Like, we talk about stewardship, and people say, yes, our money. If you think your stewardship is only your money, then you're missing the biggest thing that God gave you. Because he gave you your kids and he gave them to you because he wants you to raise them right to bring him glory. And the grandma knew that she better get him as a baby because if she waited until he grew up, it would be bad for her. And the reality of it is seven years passed and when they announced his kingship, it was bad for her. We don't always have to protect our kids because our kids are going to go up and they're going to be able to handle their own. But we have, to, we have to make sure that they grow up to be strong and to be able to handle their own. And the hiding, the hiding process, the protection process, always starts at home. It's time for our individual houses to become the place of protection for our kids. You know, like, don't get me wrong, I love the church. I think the church is the best place we can take our kids. These walls here, they're a hiding place as well. But if we were honest with ourselves, in your best week, how many hours does your kid spend here? A few? I'm saying if like, let's say that you, you, you got here at like eight o'clock in the morning, like you might be here like maybe four hours today. God bless your heart if you bring him on Asheya, which we might chalk up like another hour there, maybe even two if you come earlier, you stay late, maybe six. But the reality of it is, that's never gonna be enough. Your home is the first line of defense. It's the actual hiding place. And if it doesn't start at your home, then whatever you do here is almost wasted. And I'm going to tell you, shield, oh, wow, okay, we got a lot of them here now. You know what, guys? The, all the other stuff that I talk about is probably not a little inappropriate. Let's call it a wrap for today. And if you guys, go for it. So it's, it's, really, it's a lot harder to shield them now than it used to be. A hundred percent. You got Disney shows doing what you're doing or teaching the kids how to talk back to their parents to see what they get away with. Mm-hmm. 100%. Uh, teachers are teaching them, like you said, about, oh, you, it's your choice to be a boy or a girl. Mm-hmm. So even though we're trying to teach them about God in the house and go to communion and do this and do that, it's way harder now. Like, we talk about all the time how hard it is, even though we do it. Mm-hmm. As soon as she leaves that door, even though we taught her, right? Like, like you said, the temptation of mm-hmm. all her mm-hmm. friends are doing it. 100%. You know, oh, I want her, you know, there's the, the YouTube or Netflix or TikTok or all these things. Like, I, I, Michael, I, I hear you 100%. So let me ask you guys, what do you guys think? Two things come to mind for me. What do you guys think? That's right. The problem's real. Like, there's no downgrading the problem at all. Like, the problem is what the problem is. But we've got to have a solution. You can never talk to your kids too much. Okay. And then to be corrected. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I was thinking. And, I, and I'll, I'll say just um, two things comes to mind for me, right? Number one, it's access. Okay. One of, um, one of the things we all need to worry about is what we give our kids access to. There's some stuff that you can't control, right? Like when they go to school and they're friends, that's, that's, that ship has set sail. Like you don't have any access to filter that stuff out. Okay. But you start thinking about what do I have access to in the house? Okay, like, look, I'll be honest with you, the Disney shows, those things set sell for me a long time ago. Like, it's just the stuff that they're pushing and it scares me. And there's a lot of people who they have this mentality where if you get the kids, you get the future. Right. So all of the agenda of pushing that they're doing, they're not starting it with us. We're setting our ways. So they're normalizing it to the kids. So in 10, 15, 20 years from now, all of this stuff's normal. So I would say when it comes to media, you have to be involved in what they're consuming. Right. Parenting word of advice here, and this is by by no means, I don't know this all, I read it somewhere and I disagree with it. It's 
your kids should not have phones in their rooms at night, period, right? And I'm going to tell you for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the, the, one of the things that I never really thought about, I only have boys, so I'm not as worried about this, although it still does concern. They said like when we were young and we used to go to school and we used to get made fun of like the bullying part, not me, of course, I'm sure other people, but, um, when you went home, you were safe, right? They said now with social media, you can get be bullied 24 hours a day and you have people who are up tormented at night because they're getting ugly messages at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. And if you do not think that that affects you, of course it affects you, right? So there should be like a, a, a lights out time at like whether it be seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you know, phone is charging or a phone, iPad, anything that takes power is basically in mom and dad's room charging, right? So the first thing we have to do is we have to control the input, right? Like whatever they're allowed to consume. The second thing, and this is something that it was a statistic that I heard that, that gave me rest, and it said that don't believe the hype. The biggest influence in your child's life are the parents. It's more than the friends. It's more than the, co uh, it's more than the, 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 the teachers. It's more than all of these other people, even more than the phone. So like Christina was saying, is like we've got to constantly be pouring truth into our kids, always pouring truth into our kids, right? Because our kids are going to have a lot of questions. The only question is whether or not you're going to be lucky enough that they're going to share them with you. And then you just need to make sure that you're always communicating because the more that you're communicating, those questions will come up, right? I will tell you my own confession as a father, one of the hardest times for me is when I've been at work all day, I get home, we do homework, we do the bedtime routine, we do like, you know, everything else. I'm tucking my kid in. And this is after the third time he tells me he comes downstairs because he wants water. And then two more times because he's hungry. And when I'm finally in bed, like trying to get him to like knock out, he says, dad, I have a question. And the, and the, and, and the tired parent part of me wants to be like, ask me tomorrow right? Or stop trying to like buy yourself another five or 10 minutes, just go to sleep. Yeah, no, but it was funny because I was listening to a talk about parenting one time and they said that that question is usually the question that that kid's been carrying around, but hasn't know how to ask. So they said that question right when they're going to sleep, always take that question, right? So, uh, you know, I, I know it's not foolproof and I wish it was a math equation, but what I'm just going to tell you specifically to that is we have to make sure, like, this was part of the stuff that I was going to go into. We could save, save it for another day. But one of the things I was always going to go into is, guys, if you've got kids and you don't have an internet filter, that's your bad. Like, that's your bad. If you think people are not going to stumble across something on internet searches, that's your bad. If you think you've got a kid who has a question and they're too shy to ask you, if you think that they're not going to Google it, that's your bad. So there's a part of it where I'm telling you that there's a lot of things that as parents we can step into to safeguard our kids, to really protect them, to really hide them. You know, we've got, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s who can't handle Google searches. And we're going to give it to our kids and expect for them to be mature enough to, to navigate that. Like there's certain things that, that we, have to, we have to get better at to protect our kids. And we'll, we'll call it a day there. We could pick up on this on, on a different time. But I'm going to tell you, like I said in my, in my prayer, because I'm very, very passionate about this. I believe that there are certain steps that God is, is requiring from each and every single one of us here. I challenge you to pray so that he can open your eyes to them. It could just be a feeling in your heart, a nagging thought in your mind. But if God's most precious thing that he ever gave you are your kids, don't you think he's going to be an active participant in raising them? He will. But we just have to make the space for him to speak and for us to listen. And then not only to be hearers, but to be hearers and doers. Amen? All right, let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for that story, Lord. Such, such a convicting story, Lord, that the Son with potential, Lord, the Son with promise, the Son with the future, Lord, he's, he is the one that is being attacked, Lord. He is the one that, that Satan wants to go after, Lord. And these kids, they're living in our houses, and we are the ones who are supposed to be protecting them and hiding them from, from evil, 
So, Lord, I ask that you just open our eyes to the spite, Lord, to the struggle, because I know that you have a plan in all of this. And, Lord, I know that these kids are entrusted to us, Lord, but you would not leave us helpless either. So, Lord, starting today, starting today, Lord, teach us how to put hedges. Lord, just hedges around our kids, hedges of protection. Lord, I ask that you make us better parents, Lord. That, this, that when we start talking about how important you are in our life and how important that they should, the way that they should hold on to you, the way that they should seek you, and the way that they should serve you, Lord, that it's not just lip service, Lord, but that it truly reconciles in what they see in our lives as well. Let us model this, Lord. Let us model how great of a God you are, how worthy you are of our service, our love, our attention. Because, Lord, I, I just hope that when my kids look, Lord, they'll, they'll be, the, he will be real through the relationship that I have with you, Lord. And I pray that for everybody in this room, that you open our eyes, Lord, to how we could be better examples to our kids, Lord. Enough teaching them the bad stuff, all of our bad habits, Lord. But I ask that you allow us to just teach them the good. I ask that you have mercy on me, Lord. Lord, that you have mercy on this whole group, that you our sins, Lord, and you hear us when we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed.